Okay, well, our time is here. We have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, more than we can cover. We've got three more doctrines of the doctrines of grace. Uh, I doubt we'll get to much on the perseverance of the saints. Uh, I'd like to try to talk a little bit, or mostly about limited atonement, because that's the most... Uh, well, it continues with the tricky themes uh, when it comes to our understanding of or conception of justice. Uh, some of those themes that we, we touched on last week with election. Irresistible grace uh, has some prickly parts to it for some, but I don't think it's as problematic as some of the earlier doctrines. And the perseverance of the saints is not without some question for, for some in the church, but I think uh, it's ultimately a reassuring doctrine that most of us are in favor of. Uh, we want to know that we can make it to the end. It's just a question of how do we know that, and does that um, security lie in us, or does it lie in the Lord? And the good news is it lies in the Lord, and so uh, I think it's ultimately a positive doctrine. Okay, well, let's uh, begin with prayer, and then we'll dive into it. Father, we are grateful for this time that we set aside on Sunday mornings to think more closely about some of these important matters that are um, part of a doctrinal system, yes, but uh, we are interested in them because they are revealed in your word. And we want to know what your word teaches. We want to know what it means to be uh, a disciple, what it means to be uh, filled with the knowledge and the spirit of God. We pray, Lord, that our consideration of these things would help us uh, to be better uh, in our Christian faith and witness. Help us, Lord, to be better in our um, life as a church. Help us to be better worshipers as we recognize, Lord, that uh, all things are from you and to you and through you. And so we pray, Lord, your blessing upon our time together this, this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we talked a lot about total depravity. We talked a good deal about unconditional election. We didn't talk about everything that could be said about either of those doctrines, uh, and there was a, a lot of fun and interesting things uh, to talk about um, with election, but I'm going to move us along because we are at the last day. I want us to talk about uh, limited atonement or what we uh, might also refer to as particular redemption. And as we put this doctrine on the table, in what ways are things made particular? Uh, as we put this doctrine on the table for our consideration and uh, discussion, I want to frame the, t the discussion with a few preliminary questions that were raised by John Murray. John Murray, is that a name that is familiar to some or uh, many of you? John Murray was a Scotsman, and uh, uh, so he gets bonus points for being a Presbyterian minister and theologian, uh, being from Scotland. Uh, he taught at uh, Westminster, Philadelphia, Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, uh, and um, was somewhat uh, famous, perhaps infamous. He was infamous because he wrote a book called um, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, in which he makes the argument for particular redemption, um, redemption accomplished and applied. Uh, he also was known somewhat, um, be, somewhat infamously because he had a glass eye. I don't know if you knew that he had a glass eye. Uh, and uh, there was some legend surrounding the glass eye. Uh, I heard this uh, shared, I think, by um, Alistair Begg, who's another fellow Scotsman, uh, who said the, the question was often asked, how do you know, how can you tell which of the two eyes is the glass eye? And uh, the uh, response that came back that, that, that bubbled up into infamy, into legend and lore, is that the glass eye was the eye that had a glimmer of hope in it. So, <laughs> that was, uh, that's how you came to know uh, which one had the glass eye. Uh, but he was, not a, he was a Scotsman. He was not an austere man, but he was a very serious man, a very serious thinker, a very serious theologian <clears throat> when it came to understanding the doctrines of grace and what it was that the Bible teaches. And here are some preliminary questions that Murray raises to help frame our consideration of the atonement, how it is accomplished, how it is applied. Uh, and so Murray asked this, did Christ come to make sins expiable? Did Christ come to make sins 
expiable. Now, that word expiation is part of a family of words. Uh, expiation is uh, connected with the word propitiation, which is connected with the word atonement, which is connected with the word justification. All these words, you'll be happy to know, are words that we spend some time uh, working through with our confirmands, actually. Uh, it's important that they understand those words because they're all Bible words. They're, uh, the word atonement is found in the Bible. The word propitiation is found in the Bible. The word justification is found in the Bible. Depending on what translation you have, uh, expiation is a little bit uh, more rare, but it is there in the original languages. Uh, justification, uh, we all know what's the shorthand definition of what justification is. Just as if I never sinned, justification. Atonement, uh, the shorthand definition for that is what? At one mint, at one with God, reunited with God. Propitiation, that's a wonderful uh, 25 cent theological word. You pay a little extra for that one, but it is actually in the Bible. Propitiation has to do with the aversion of God's wrath. So think of it this way, the way I teach it to the uh, confirmation kids. Uh, because of what Adam and Eve did at the garden, they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in doing that, they took the crown of glory that God had put on them being made in the image and the likeness of God. They took the crown of glory off their head and they put onto their head sin. Sin is on their head. And as a result of that, God's justice and wrath, and I've defined, uh, I've defined in the past and continue to define God's wrath as His motivated love to set all things to rights, uh, His wrath, His justice, think of that as a heat-seeking missile. Except for seeking heat, it seeks out sin. God's justice seeks out sin, and it's like a missile that's been launched from heaven, and it is going, and, uh, going to attack sin because God wants to remove sin out of His good created order. The problem is you and I are wearing sin on our heads like a crown. And so what does that mean? Where is the missile going? It's going right here. And so the great uh, glory, one of the great glories of the cross is that Christ on the cross takes the sin that is on our head and puts it on himself. The sin of the world is on him. And so the wrath of God, which is being directed towards us, is averted like that heat-seeking missile because it's seeking out sin and lands not on our head, but on Christ's head. That's what propitiation is. Expiation is the prefix, uh, helps us to understand, the prefix ex, meaning out, uh, has to do with the understanding that God is taking sin out of us. That's part of the whole act of propitiation. God takes the sin out of us, puts it on the Son, so the sin is removed from us. The question that Murray is asking is, did Christ come to make sin expiable? Does it have the potential to come out of us? Or did he expiate sins? After, and then he quotes Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Second question. Did Christ come to make God reconcilable? So we know that uh, because of sin, as uh, Paul puts it in Ephesians, there's a dividing wall of hostility that separates us from God the Father. Sometimes... In some, uh, Art and I were just talking about um, methods of uh, teaching evangelism. Uh, sometimes uh, Art was uh, learning a new curriculum at a presbytery meeting. It had to do with circles, kind of in a concentric circle kind of way. He said, it's really, it's a new, new way of talking about the, the ledge. You guys know this? Do you guys know this uh, whole scheme here for evangelism? This is, this is you and me. This is a holy God. We use the, word, we use the uh, Greek term theta for God. There's this gap which is created by sin. I, always, I do this with the kids too. I always put little jagged rocks here. You know, and then I put, I put some people here who have fallen down. Ah. Yep, broken back. A couple of folks, you know, like this. Ah. Oh. You try to make the leap, 
but you can't make the leap. You never, there's, there's never enough strength in here to get through the gap. There's a dividing wall uh, of hostility. But the cross comes, and uh, if I can do this three-dimensionally, the cross comes and creates a bridge, and Jesus is the way in which the, the, that removes that dividing, if not a dividing wall, a dividing pit of hostility that keeps us from God the Father. And so the question that Murray is asking is, did Christ come to make God reconcilable so that, so that there's, a, there's now this bridge that we can go across, or uh, did Christ reconcile us to God by his own blood? You're starting to pick up a pattern here. I'll, I'll ask one more question, and then I'll reveal the pattern specifically. Third, did Christ come to make the salvation of men possible or uh, to, excuse me, to remove obstacles that stood in the way of salvation uh, to make provision for salvation or did he come to save people? So the question that these, the issue that these questions are trying to illuminate is the distinction between potentiality and actuality. Potential put this sort of over the top of everything, potential versus actual. Potential salvation versus actual salvation. What did Christ's death on the cross accomplish? Redemption accomplished and applied. That was the name of the book that he wrote. What did Christ's death accomplish? Did it create a situation for potentiality or did it actually do something? Number four, did Christ come to put all men in a savable state or did he come to secure the salvation of all those who are ordained unto eternal life? What did the death of Christ on the cross do? What did it accomplish? Did Christ come to make men redeemable or did he effectually and uh, infallibly, uh, did he come to effectually and infallibly redeem? Did he make men redeemable or did he actually redeem? What is offered to men in the gospel? Is it the possibility of salvation, the opportunity for salvation, or is, in fact, salvation offered? Saved. You are saved. Does Christ save or has Christ saved? What happened on the cross? What happened on the cross? Now, that's all connected to Uh, the atonement, let's just look at the second half of that phrase, limited atonement. We're just talking about the second word, atonement, not limited yet, but the second word. What did Christ do on the cross? What does the Bible seem to teach? That that God set the world in such a way that it was filled with, uh, uh, I remember as a kid, um, uh, learning the difference between potential energy and I think it's kinetic energy. Is that right? I'm not a scientist. Am I on the right track? Okay. Potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is all the energy that's stored up, right? And uh, kinetic energy is the, is the energy that's released, and it's, it's at work, it's active, and it's doing something. Uh, my my um, wife was taught by uh, Mr. Palco. Is that a name? Anybody remembers Palco? He, Tyler Palco's father, he was, the, uh, he was the quarterback at West Allegheny, and then he went on to uh, play for four years at Pitt, and then he had a miserable career in the NFL, uh, if you remember that. Very brief and miserable, distinguishedly, distinguished miserable career. Um, but uh, he was a really good teacher, and he talked about the difference between poten- uh, potential energy and kinetic energy, and he stood on the desk, and he was crouched like this, and this was all potential energy, and then he leaped off the desk and said, that's kinetic energy. So what's happening at the cross? Is it all potential or is it actual? What did the cross of Christ do? Well, the Bible teaches that something actually happened. It didn't just set the stage for things to happen. It didn't just create the conditions that more things could happen. Jesus actually accomplished something on the cross. On the cross, the dividing wall of hostility is, is broken. And what it was the sign that was given that this actually happened? What does the Bible tell us was the sign? I'm seeing in hand gestures. The curtain was rent in two. The, 
from top to bottom. And why is that significant? Because there's nobody who could get to the top. <laughs> it, it came from above. God rips the veil open and the dividing wall of hostility is removed because something actually happened on the cross. The cross didn't just create the conditions for something good to happen. Something good did happen. And that's an important dis distinction to begin with because if, if something did happen, then the next question is, what happened? What exactly happened uh, through the atonement? What exactly happened uh, on the cross. Now, I want to move us a little bit further in uh, defining uh, the positions, and I'm going to make a distinction. I, I, again, I, I want to always reiterate that I want to be charitable, a charitably reformed, not, not totally reformed, not tragically reformed, but charitably reformed, uh, and I want to make positive affirmations, but I do want to make some distinctions between some, some generic but prevailing ways of thinking. One camp, or what we might consider sort of the broad uh, the broad uh, Arminian position believes that Jesus died for all men and women and that the only thing that keeps them from the benefit of his death is their unbelief or lack of faith. There is the, the stage is set. All the potential energy is put into the created order. It is like a, uh, a spring uh, or like a, a mouse trap, if you will. And if the right thing is, the right conditions are put in place, all, the energy will be released and things will happen. Uh, that's, that is the, the, the view of the universe or the world that we're living in that is established by the, uh, by the death of Christ uh, on the world in that theological system. Those who hold to the reform position affirm that Jesus died and he accomplished something, but he accomplished something for a group of people that we call the elect, which we discussed uh, last last two weeks with unconditional election. Jesus died for a select people, the elect, those whom the Father specifically gave to Jesus, and that his atonement accomplished their salvation, and therefore that all these are certain to be saved. So the question is, did God create the conditions in the world whereby there's, connect, there's potential energy put into the world whereby anybody can, be, can possibly be saved? Or did God save his people on the cross? Is the cross of Christ a victory or is it a potential victory? Is it an actual victory or a potential victory? Is everybody tracking with the way I'm, I'm framing this? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. Anybody have any questions about any of this thus far before, before moving on? Okay. So then... We want to ask the question about the scope of the atonement. We're talking about, first, what is the atonement? Is it actual or potential? And then we're going to talk about the scope. How far does it go? How far does the atonement go? So as the, doctrine, as the name in the, of the doctrine uh, suggests, the, do, the, uh, the doctrine of a limited atonement asserts that the atonement is limited in some capacity. Did I spell something wrong? Oh. Oh. I'm very happy to see they're, they're in love. <laughs> the issue of limitation is really not, is not the sticking point. That's not the offensive point. Uh, actually, both Arminians and, and Reformed folks would agree that the atonement is limited Unless you are a universalist, and we'll get to that in just a second, uh, the question isn't if, the question is how. How is the atonement limited? Uh, and we get to that first by, um, by having to assess and then ultimately reject the doctrine of universalism, the doctrine of universalism. What is the doctrine of universalism? The doctrine of universalism is everybody ultimately goes to heaven. Everybody ultimately goes to heaven. All dogs go to heaven. That's the thing that always comes to my mind too, yeah. All dogs go to heaven. And I understand the impulse for that because there's a, um, a desire to want to uh, describe God, to understand God in the most loving possible terms because God is uh, a God of love, um, as is asserted by some. Uh, that love 
uh, must be predominant and must prevail. And so the logical sequence of things ultimately goes towards God's love is so great that all, all dogs go to heaven. The only problem with that is it's entirely unbiblical. Um, the Bible asserts again and again and again and again and again that not everybody goes to heaven. Even if, the, if, even if you're in dispute about how that happens, if you're reading the Bible charitably, honestly, you, you recognize that people go to hell. Jesus talked about it. The apostles talked about it. Uh, the Old Testament witness uh, had it in view. There are, sadly, ultimately, uh, people who are in hell. But that doesn't take anything away from God in terms of His justice, and it doesn't take anything away from God in terms of His love. Uh, God maintains His love, and He maintains His justice, and people do, in fact, go to hell. Now the question is, um, how, do they, how does that happen? Universalism isn't much... Um, affirmed uh, these days, but uh, it continues to be there. It continues to flirt within uh, and around orthodoxy. Some famous uh, either actual or potential universalists. Um, he wasn't a full-blown universalist, but he was, he was on his way to it, is a Reformed theologian by the name of or a neo-orthodox theologian, which is a slightly different animal. But uh, Karl Barth, uh, was on his way towards that. So there's always a temptation to um, uh, pronounce his last name Barth, but that's not how it's pronounced. It's Carl Barth, B-A-R-T-H. Uh, towards the end of his life and towards the end of his um, career as a theologian, he was, he was definitely tilting in that direction, and um, that was concerning for those who were within the Orthodox and, and the Reformed tradition. Uh, a lesser-known um, theologian, by the name of David Bentley Hart. Anybody know that name? Uh, brilliant, brilliant scholar, actually. Um, has written, uh, he's, he's a, he's, he is one of the m more difficult theologians I've ever attempted to read. He's just so dense, uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, he's an Orthodox theologian, but he has recently come to the position publicly that he believes that hell does not exist. There is no hell. Um, it's, it's a it's sort of a mythic idea, it's sort of symbolic, but it's not actual and real. Um, it's, it's out there, you can read about it online. It's, it's really quite sad, but um, when, when you get rid of hell, what's left? Universalism. Um, unless you are a, um, unless you are a, what's the, the theological term of art? A, nihil, a nihilist, a nihilism in which uh, things just go away. No, people aren't in hell, they're just got, evaporated, um, which I don't think seems to be biblically supported either. Um, so uh, there's, there's not that many universalists, but it's always there. A more popular uh, potential, if not actual universalist, that has made its way into some Reformed and Presbyterian uh, churches and thinking, anybody know the name? Uh, let, me, let me put it to you this way. You might know the book title, Love Wins. Love Wins. Anybody know his name? Rob Bell. Rob Bell, Rob Bell who now, uh, he left his church, he now works for Oprah. And uh, <clears throat> Harpo, uh, Harpo Productions, yeah, he works for Harpo Productions. Um, he wrote a book called Love Wins. You can see it on, on uh, church signs, even down the street, and the, the Prevailing thought behind love wins is all dogs go to heaven. Yes. What about the prosperity gospel? Does that have universalism as a part of it? They might run in similar circles, but I don't think the one is necessarily informed by the other, at least not based on my read of the situation. Um, depending on how fiery of a preacher you are, you might really need you know hell in your back pocket to to cudgel people. So you may, they may not want to give that up as much, you know, because if you don't give, you might go to hell. So wow, that's leverage. <laughs> don't give up your leverage. Um, so the question of the scope is not a, it's, it's not a, um, if you're orthodox, it's really not uh, a uh, scary question. It's one that we've, we all accept. 
Uh, it's just a matter of how is it limited. Is it limited because God is limited, or is it limited because we, we, limit, it, we limit it? Arminian position is that Jesus' death was not an actual atonement, but only uh, something that makes atonement possible. The atonement becomes actual when the sinner repents of his or her sins and believes on Jesus. That's a very generic um, definition of it, but I think it gets to the essence of it. The Reformed position is that Jesus' death was an actual atonement for the sin of God's people, as we said, and uh, the result that uh, these and only these are delivered from sin's penalty. Universalism says Jesus' death was an actual atonement for the sin of all people with the result that all people are ultimately saved. So if we reject universalism, then the distinction is between potential salvation and actual salvation um, uh, for, for people. It's not a matter of universal or actual salvation for everybody. It's a matter of potential versus actual and who actually gets saved. So um, what, does the, uh, what does the atonement do? I've already alluded to it. There is redemption that is accomplished. There is propitiation that is accomplished. There is reconciliation that is accomplished. There is expiation that is accomplished. All these things are actually happening on the cross. Christ's work on the cross was not a hypothetical salvation for hypothetical believers, but a real and definite salvation for God's own chosen people. A redemption that does not redeem a propitiation that does not propitiate, a reconciliation that does not reconcile, an atonement that does not atone cannot help anybody. But a redemption that redeems, a propitiation that propitiates, a reconciliation that reconciles, atonement that actually atones, reveals something amazing. It's grace. God does this by grace. He decides to do it, and He does it, and He accomplishes it for us, not based on anything that we did, not based on anything that He foresaw, but it was out of the pleasure of His will, out of the, the, the inscrutability of His will, He does this, and we receive it by grace. Yes, Sass. Right, yes. I didn't get to it uh, explicitly when we were talking about election, but uh, if, we were to, if we were to ask the question as, uh, in such a way as uh, the Arminian position does and says, well, God is seeing these things by his foreknowledge, and because he knows what's going to happen within the world of potentiality, he then follows through and, and makes it actual. But the question that has to be asked in keeping with the way Sass framed it is, if God were to look down the corridors of time, what is it that he will always see when it comes to sinners? People who don't want God. That's, that's the picture. That's the sight picture, and it's always there. That doesn't change, and that, goes, that takes us back to the doctrine of total depravity. If we believe that total depravity is what it claims to be, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. There is nobody who wants God, who loves God, who knows God. We've all rejected God. That, that just continues to, to, to happen. Now that enters into the question of, 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 of uh, effectual grace and uh, potential, these, this idea of potentiality, provenient grace. Does that begin to you know, shift the equation a little bit? Um, those are all really interesting questions. Um, that we don't have time to discuss, um, but, the, but the question of is God actually saving people or just making it potential is the issue of, the, of a limited atonement. Because the atonement, if we believe that the atonement actually achieves salvation, then uh, it achieves it for some and, and not for others. It is by definition limited. It is by definition a limited atonement. Okay. Okay. Any questions on... Yes, go ahead, Scott. How do you handle uh, John 
Oh, it's a good question. Uh, that's, that's my very next point. The issue has to do with the, the distinction that we would make between sufficiency versus efficiency. Is Christ's atonement, how is it sufficient and how is it efficient? Uh, there are many difficult texts to consider, more than we can enumerate here. But the one we all know, and we see not so much anymore, but we used to see at the uh, end zone of football games, uh, is what? John 3.16. And what does that say? We all know it. Let's recite it. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So that seems, <laughs> potentially, <laughs> yeah, that seems to suggest that um, what's at view here is, that it, it, well, it can lend you, lead you down the road of universalism. Uh, for God loves, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. Now, the, the question is whosoever, and how does that happen? Carl, yeah. Mm -hmm. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, right. but to save it. Save the world. Right, all save the world. The world. Right. right, right. Now, I remember going through this in um, uh, undergraduate and graduate studies, and I, I always, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I thought that when I first heard this explanation, I thought it was a cop-out. Um, but I think the more I stay with it, the more I'm, I'm recognizing the veracity of this as I give closer and closer attention to language. The question arises, when you say the word world, who's in view? When John says the world, who's in view? Who is in view with all? When, when, when the Bible talks about all, who are the all? I'll give you an example. If I say at the end of this class, everyone is now dismissed to worship. Who, who do I have in view when I say everyone is now dismissed to worship? Let people go to the 11 a.m. Because if you were at 8.30, you're going home. You've been here. You did your thing. So, uh, the, so even in this room, it may not even assume the entire room. Everyone is now dismissed for worship. Uh, that applies to those who are going upstairs. Right. Every, but when I, say everyone, when, when I say everyone is now dismissed to worship, I don't have in view when I say the entire world. Although everyone sounds like everyone. Right? Everybody could, it could be inferred that everyone means everyone. So when John says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, there's a hermeneutical um, clarity that is required or a close reading of the text. Uh, the word hermeneutic, is that a word that's uh, familiar to most of us? Uh, we make a distinction between exegesis, that is taking out or uh, getting out of the text what is being said, and then hermeneutics has to do with interpreting what you're taking out. How do, we in, how do we rightly interpret? What is the sense? What is the meaning? What is the intent of the word? So what I want to say is uh, when you say everyone is now dismissed to worship doesn't necess necessitate a universal call. Uh, that kind of a consideration of the grammar, the syntax, the, the exegesis, the hermeneutics, requires a close reading of the entire message of what John is saying, the entire message of what um, the New Testament is saying, the entire message of what the, what the Bible is saying. This is the great benefit uh, of the school of theology in which I was trained in, one that I would affirm is the correct way of being trained, which is uh, biblical theology or whole Bible theology. You have to have the whole Bible uh, we're always tempted to have a canon inside the canon. They're the, they're the special text. And Reformed people are, are just as guilty of doing this. There's some Reformed people who only want to live in Romans 9, 10, and 11. That's their special, super special inspired text. Uh, even, even Reformed folks have to take Romans 9, 10, 11 and, and, and have it uh, read within the light of the entire gospel, the entire uh, message uh, of the Word of God. A canon within a canon uh, gets you to a places where you want to just look at the red letters. You ever heard of like red letter Christians? Um, we just, what are the inspired words of Jesus? Those are more inspired 
You have inspiration, but then you have the really inspired stuff. Um, there's a temptation to um, have our set or uh, our, our select list of inspired texts, John 3.16. And I understand the evangelistic um, impetus behind that, why that's important. But you also have the, the possibility to begin to abstract things. And then when you abstract them, you, uh, that takes you one step closer uh, towards, uh, one step away from exegesis and one step closer towards uh, its corollary uh, or opposite, which we call eisegesis. What is eisegesis? Exegesis is it's deriving meaning out of the text. Eisegesis is imputing meaning to the text, importing it into the text. Now, we all do this. It's not a matter of if we do this. It's a matter of when and where and how. And so we, we, we have to be vigilant in recognizing that that's coming. We all come with our presuppositions. We all come with our experiences. We all come with um, things that we learned when we were kids. And we import all these things uh, into the Bible. And, and so uh, one of the things, John Frame, is that a name that's familiar to some of you? Son of this congregation, proud to claim him. Dr. Frame, if you ever watch this... We love you. Um, he was on the podcast not too long ago. I, I, and on the podcast, I talked to Dr. Frame, and, and he was the guy that uh, I was listening to a podcast lecture that he was teaching on. Um, it wasn't the Federal Vision. It was, what was the, Open Theism. He was critiquing Open Theism. I won't bother you with all that, with all that is. But he said he appreciated that this issue was being raised because it forced him to go back to the text and, and ask the question, oh, all right, what's Open Theism purporting, uh, and what does the Bible actually say? And so he had to go back to the Bible, and he was reviewing the text so that he wasn't allowing certain things to get dusty and, and to, and to uh, import his own understanding. He wanted to go back to what the Bible said. Peter, did you have a question-ish? You tell me since I'm in Greek class, it's like my underwear out, not show it on the outside, but I always have it with you. Yes, yes right. <laughs> the word in John 3.16, if it's helpful, that's been helpful to me, so... Sometimes we think of God so loved the world as yeah. an explanation of how deep and how powerful it is. Yes. But that word, it, it actually means in this way. For God yes. thusly loved the world almost as a preamble to and then describing the yes. way that God thus loves. That's been helpful to me in thinking about eisegesis versus exegesis yep. of that passage. Yeah. So when we hear in colloquial language from our high school daughters, I'm saying this because I have one. Uh, I so want to go do this or that. Uh, you had a couple of daughters. You know what that's like, right? I so want to. It, it's emphatic. It gives a sense of emphasis. Um, and, and we begin to import that kind of thinking uh, when, we, when we come to the text. But Peter makes a, a good point, which is a close reading of the text, a, glo a close reading of the grammar, uh, and not just in isolation, but also then recognizing it with, within a... Uh, John 3.16 is situated within an entire chapter. That chapter is situated within an entire book. That book is situated within a family of books called the Gospels. That The Gospels are situated within the New Testament. And the New Testament is not um, extra specially inspired. It's within the whole Bible. And so we have to... We have to work with these things within a, the context of the whole. So uh, in this way would be the grammatical reading of the word so. Is that correct in this way? Yeah. yeah. Not it's not an emphatic word. Uh, Andy and then Mark, yeah. With that in mind, like reading it within like the biblical framework, a couple things come to mind. First of all, to read it when it says God has been coming into the world to save the world. The first thing Scott always dug into me was save from what? Well, and, and also, what does a saved world look like from God's view? God's view, the created order, was what he created the world to be. And so then a saved world would be the restoration of that. Mm -hmm. The new heaven and the new earth that we talk about in Revelation. It, it, it kind of, you have to check your eschatology too. Like, what's your view of the end? Mm -hmm. So is our view of the end that everyone comes to the fold is our view of the end that God is working in this way mm -hmm. to save the world because the other only other option is 
Either he saves the created order through his grace, or he destroys all sin, mm -hmm. which we talked about. And then the world is no longer saved, it's destroyed, because that's the heaviness and weightiness of sin. Yeah, we typically, and, and I think it's probably informed mostly by our prevailing therapeutic way of thinking about the Bible and God. Um, again, uh, Carl Truman did an expert, wonderful, masterful job of, of uh, reviewing the, the history of this in his book. Um, oh, I can't remember the title of it now. The Rise and Fall, of, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I was stuck on expressive individualism. Um, he, he traces the history of this, the therapeutic, the rise of the therapeutic self. We typically think of God as a really nice guy who wants to fix our problem, you know, the, the problems that we're dealing with. It, the, there's all this potential uh, goodness, latent goodness, that if we could just get out of our own way, if we could just get a hand up, we'd be able to express this. And so God's salvation is a salvation in which he's, he's, he's tinkering with broken things and he's making them better. And so the, the view of the problem is, is the view from below. It's, it's the mess that we're in. But there's another problem, and it's even a scarier problem than the, the brokenness of the world. It's a holy God. See, the atonement was necessary because God is our enemy. In sin, God is our enemy. And he's coming after us. Now, he's doing it righteously, He's doing it in a holy way. He's doing it actually in a loving way, a love that is big love, motivated love. But he's coming after us. And um, it's not just a God is saving us from the weaknesses or the, you know, we just keep tripping over our laces over here and he's coming down to tie them up tight so that we can just run. No, we're here loaded for bear, ready to go to war. And we're trying to fight an enemy that we cannot prevail against. He is going, he has got artillery and firepower that, that overpowers us because we're the enemy. And so uh, God, how do, you, how do you make God the enemy into God your friend? Well, you can't. You can't do that. I can't do that. We can't do that. God has to do that. And there was only one way to do it. And that was by Jesus giving his life. God himself did it. God was the means by, way, by which he made himself, uh, taking us from being his enemy to being his friend. And so when we're, being, when we're being saved, we're not just being saved from the sin that so frequently entangles us. We're being saved from a holy God who is, who is going to make the world right. And the problem is that we're the problem. We're, we're making the world not right. Yeah, yes, Sarah. Oh, John 3, 19 says, men love darkness rather than light. Ah, we're, we're doing whole Bible theology. Bible. Yes. So you're going to look at yep. 16. you got to look at 16, 17, 18, 18 19. 19, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, but so it's nice to pull that out, but at the same time, you need to be following because we're all condemned already. Yeah. So. It's a great, great point. Yeah, Andrew, and then I'm going to make uh, another point here. Go ahead. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel like one thing that might be missing in this conversation is the whole point of this, is it, uh, of the whole Bible story, is it for God to save us or is it to glorify Christ? And I think that the more we think about ourselves, the more it becomes about God saving us mm -hmm. as opposed to God glorifying Christ. And I think, I don't know, I think it's important to remember that. Yes, there, there is a tension that develops between is the whole Bible project about me or is the whole Bible project about God? Is the, whole, is the whole Edenic project about me or is the whole Edenic project about God? It's always about God. Now, we think, well, that's just so egotistical. That's just so, you know, it's so, he's so full of himself. <laughs> well, he's the best. <laughs> You go back to theology proper. There's nothing better. And the glorification of God is what's in our best interest. That's the, that's the irony is our best interest is not us. Our best interest is God. 
and, and the Bible is, is seeking to uh, reveal that. Okay, I want to move us on to then the next, I think, sticky wicket after the, the great question uh, John, or excuse me, that Scott raised because I had it in my notes next. It was brilliant. Um, is not just some of these tricky questions, but it leads us to the next issue. Well, what about evangelism? If the doctrine of limited atonement says that the Bible is, uh, teaches that, that, that there is a limit to those who will be saved, why bother with evangelism? Why even go out and say anything? Because uh, the, the chosen are the chosen, and we can just stay frozen, and things are going to happen. Um, well, a few things that I would say in response to that. First of all is the Bible commands us to proclaim the gospel. That's God. We're not in a position to argue with God about how he wants to limit things, the potential versus actual. And we're not in a, we're not in a position to argue with God and say, well... Find your own way. You, you're, it's your problem, Lord, figure it out. That's, that's not our prerogative. God has said, I have blessed particular means. These are the means of grace. Word, sacrament, the church is a, is a it's not a sacramental means of grace, but it is a means of grace. They, these are the things that God has invested himself by which agency uh, takes place and people hear the gospel and people are, are saved. It's part of his inscrutable will. It's part of his plan. And the question for us is, are we going to be obedient to that or are we going to quibble with means? And so I want to I begin by, by asserting, I think, clearly that we do this because, and not just because the Bible commands it, therefore we do it. The Bible commands it and, at least in my case, I think probably in your case too, we love God. We, when we recognize what He has done for us, uh, and, and uh, the whole system of Reformed theology takes us back and back and back again. We're not gonna, it's not one of the five that we're looking at, but it's one of the five of the other system, sola dea gloria, which means what? To, glory, to God alone be the glory. All of this leads me back to worship. All of this leads me back to obedience. All of this leads me back to coming to the Lord as a steward and saying, this really is all about you. This really all is of you. This really all uh, is grace indescribable. It is love that is amazing. This is why John Newton could say amazing grace, because... He was a wretched sinner, and he was never going to tilt towards the Lord. He was never going on his own strength and his own insight, his own wisdom, going to naturally drift towards the Lord. The Lord had to do it, and the Lord saved him. He didn't make it potential salvation. He saved him. And so uh, we do it because we are people who are responding to the great love that has been shown to us. We, we, we evangelize because the Bible commands us to it. God has invested uh, himself and his power and the means of uh, turning people uh, through uh, the proclamation of the gospel. We do it because we love God. But third, I want to be a little bit more explicit about what is happening when the gospel is proclaimed. What is happening when the gospel is proclaimed? And I'm borrowing uh, from Jim J.I. Packer, who wrote a tremendous book, very slim volume, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. And this is what Packer has to say. Strictly speaking, the gospel is not so much an offer that people may politely accept or refuse according to their own pleasure. It is a command to turn away from sin and come to Jesus. It's not an offer, it's a command. We've gotten into the habit of treating the gospel as an offer, which it is in one sense, but we have forgotten that even more than an offer, it is a command to sinners to repent and believe. When Jesus came preaching the gospel in Mark uh, chapter 1, is he making offers or is he commanding? Repent. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is coming. Repent. It's a command, not an offer. It is only after people have done this and have turned to Jesus that they can know that they are among those for whom Christ died. So Packer points out that the statement, Christ died for you, which has become so common in today's evangelism, simply cannot be found in any of the sermons recorded for us in Scripture. It's not in Acts chapter 2 through 5, 7, 10, 13, 17, 22. Nowhere do the apostles say, Christ died for you. Christ died. 
repent. The fact is that the New Testament never calls any one man to repent on the ground that Christ died specifically and particularly for them. The basis on which the New Testament invites sinners is to put faith in Christ, uh, excuse me, uh, the basis on which the New Testament invites sinners to put faith in Christ is simply that they need him and that he offers himself to them and that those who receive him are promised all the benefits that his death secured for his people. What is universal and all-inclusive in the New Testament is the invitation to faith and the promise of salvation to all who believe. The gospel is not, believe that Christ died for everybody's sins and therefore for yours, any more than it is, believe that Christ died only for certain people's sins and so perhaps for yours. The gospel is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for sins and now, offer, uh, and now offers you himself as your Savior. This is the message we are to take to the world. We have no business to ask them to put faith in any view of the extent of the atonement. Our job is to point them to the living Christ and summon them to trust in Him. So we're not talking about limitations when we proclaim the gospel. We proclaim it broadly. We we, we proclaim it boldly. We uh, We proclaim it and we assert the command. Repent and believe. Christ has died for sins. You're in need of a Savior. And that's why um, I do get a little bit frustrated with some of the schemas, you know, the circles and the bridge and all that stuff. I understand the usefulness, and I understand uh, the way in which it helps people to, to understand what's going on. But it's not, it's not an inducement. It's... it's it's not uh, a way to take something that's potential and hopefully have the light bulb click on. When you, when you rely on that kind of a scheme, when you rely on that kind of inducement as the mechanism by which people are converted, you're in a different theology. Um, we have to trust that God saves his people. It's God who saves it. We have to be faithful but it's God who sees, uh, who, who does it. Well, one last quick point, and I'll get to you, Mark. The thing that I find so helpful and reassuring of that is that that means that God can use me. Because <laughs> it's not based on how articulate I am. It's not based on how clever I am. It's not based on how uh, erudite I am about theology and the scriptures. It's based on God. As I heard uh, Martin Luther say in that, that great Luther movie, God spoke through an ass once, and he can do it again. <laughs> uh, if he can speak through Balaam's ass, he can speak through me, and he can accomplish his purposes. Go ahead, Mark. So I used those circles yesterday, too. Yes. Yeah. In the way I was using it, but it's also it's the way of explaining it that, that I'm most familiar with and most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there were there were certain and they encouraged that in the teaching. They said, yeah. you know, this is a model you can use, and they even use the word open source. You yeah. can use it as you wish. But but I found myself like you said, with different models. The, the most of those models are we're the ones making the initiative to cross the bridge to make the to whatever, yeah. and and I found myself what I liked with that model was the fact that the gospel was its own circle. The gospel could be explained in whatever level of detail you wanted to, including mm-hmm. the fact that the gospel includes the fact that yeah. God uses the Holy Spirit to draw us to Himself, yeah. not just us saying, "Gee, God's got a great thing here. I'm smart enough." Yeah, this is I'm I'm willing to buy in on this. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not an investment option. It's it's 
a matter of life and death. It's, it's all of God. And I guess that's what I want to kind of, I want to close our class on. We didn't get through all of the, um, we didn't get through all of the doctrines, but all of the doctrines, and again, just to restate, why am I Reformed? I'm Reformed because these doctrines require me. They, 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 they necessarily lead me back to God. It's all of God, and therefore it's all of grace. And it's all of God's goodness and power and love and mercy. And my response is to say, thank you. It, it, it puts God where he's supposed to be, and it puts me where I'm supposed to be. And then the world starts to make sense. And I, and I actually start to experience a measure of freedom. As I said, people's salvation isn't dependent on me. It's dependent on what God is doing. I'm called to be a worshiper. I'm called to be one who responds to what God has done and, be, and to be glad about it and to be awed by it, to be humbled by it. Boy, this, I'm really not in charge here. God is in charge. And I, I, I get a sense of the grandeur of God when I wrestle with, with these doctrines. And I think that that's what the point is. I think the point is to, be, is to begin to never to ever never to f- ever fully comprehend the project of the scriptures and the project of good theology is not comprehension, it's apprehension. To get a sense of it, like like uh, Moses did. Can I see your glory? Okay, I'm gonna have to put you in a cleft in a rock, and I'm gonna have to cover you a little bit, and you're gonna get a glimpse of it. You're gonna have an apprehension of my glory. You're not gonna comprehend it but you're going you're gonna to get an apprehension of it. And these doctrines help me to apprehend the glory of God. Uh, and to the extent that I, that I drift into wanting to comprehend, that we want to comprehend, we are called to repent and say, Sol de Deo Gloria. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the time this past week, uh, and these past five weeks, and we're grateful, Lord, for the growth that we can have in grace. Help us, Lord, to continue in that grace. For your praise and your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come back next week. Uh, Carl Truman will be here. He's going to play on some of these themes, but so much more. He's a tremendous and brilliant speaker. Uh, So I'm looking forward to having you here next.